Hallelujah, what a thought Jesus' full salvation brought Victory, yes, victory Oh, let the powers of sin assail Heaven's grace can never fail Victory, yes, victory gives me victory, glory, glory, hallelujah, he is all and all to me, well I am trusting in the Lord, I am standing on his word, victory, oh victory, well I have peace and joy within, since my life is free from sin, Victory, yes, victory, well, victory, yes, victory, well, hallelujah, I am free, Jesus gives me victory, glory, glory, hallelujah, he is all and all to me, well, shout your freedom everywhere, Victory, well, victory, well, let us sing it here below in the face of every foe. Victory, yes, victory, oh, victory, yes, victory, well, hallelujah, I am free, Jesus gives me victory. Sing it on that shore when this fleeting life is o'er. Victory, oh victory. Sing it here, ye ransom throng. Start that everlasting song. Victory, yes, victory. Well, victory, yes, victory. Victory, glory, glory, hallelujah, he is all and all to me. Well, victory, yes, victory, well, hallelujah, I am free, Jesus gives me victory. all to me. Oh, He is all and all to me. Amen. We have victory this evening. Amen. Jesus grace every fetter. Oh, Jesus grace
sing that again. Oh, I will shout. Oh, hallelujah.
God bless you this evening. Let's bow our heads together. Ask the Lord to help us this evening. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful to be here. Lord, you're so good to us. You've strengthened us. You've kept us. You've brought us and drawn us to yourself. Lord, it's a manifestation of your grace in our lives, and we're so thankful to be here. While we know so many of our brothers and sisters are fighting sicknesses of various kinds, I pray you go to them now and strengthen them, even this very moment, Lord. Would your healing power, Lord, be poured out upon them, and by your stripes we know they're already healed. May it come to a manifestation now. May they recover quickly, Lord, and be able to join back in the fellowship. Lord, I ask that you would help us tonight as we look into your word. May you come yourself and break the bread of life for us and feed us of your own hand, Lord, for we're utterly, completely dependent upon you. I ask, the Lord, that your spirit would move freely, Lord, and, and God, we would do nothing or say any nothing to hinder, Lord, the flowing of your spirit, that your word might go forth in power, Lord. I pray, God, that you would take this vessel under your control and speak eternal words to these lips of clay. May that word go into our hearts, Lord. May it drop in deep and take root, Lord, and produce a crop. For that's why we've come, Lord. We've come to hear your word. We've come to worship you. We've come to feed from you. Help us, we pray, almighty God, as we surrender to you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Let's take our Bibles while we're still standing and turn to 1 John, the epistle of 1 John. Man, it's good to be together on the first official service of 2024. Amen. I'm so glad we're able to be together. God is good to us. Amen. And we pray that God, amen, starts us off on the right foot. Amen. amen. Praise God. I want to look at 1 John chapter 4. And I want to read two scriptures out of 1 John chapter 4. 1 John 4, and the first one we'll read is verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Let's go down to verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Man, God bless you as you take your seats. So we know that God is love. Amen. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Amen. And I want to take for a title, if I can, for this evening for a subject is, Love Brings Revelation, and Revelation Brings Love. Love Brings Revelation, and Revelation Brings Love. And I, I, I really want to, uh, tonight, if I could, just speak on John, the Apostle John, and the Disciple John. I want to speak on John. I want to speak on the book of John, the epistles of John, and the book of Revelation, and kind of tie all those together. And I just pray that, that you pull on the gift because I, I, all of this stuff floods through my heart as I meditate and all these pieces come together. And for me, when I'm sitting and meditating on this, I was sharing this with Brother Franco today, when I'm meditating on this, all of a sudden everything just congeals together and everything, all these little pieces become one picture. It's almost like a thousand piece jigsaw, all of a sudden I see the whole thing. And now I come with a thousand pieces and I don't know how to get you to see the same thing that I see. It's going to take the anointing of the Holy Ghost operating through a gift, amen? Because I want God to do the same thing for you that he's done for me, amen? And take all these pieces and put them together so it paints the same picture that, that is in my heart, amen? In the Ephesians church age, Brother Branham said from the church age book, he says, a few moments ago I mentioned that John understood what it was to love God. The great apostle of love would certainly see it when the church began to lose that first love of God. So Brother Branham calls John the apostle of love. He also in another place calls him the disciple of love. Amen. And, and we, know, we know because we've been through it so many times and we're going to go into it again today and read the quotes. But we know that John, amen, in the book of Revelation is a type of the church. He's a type of the bride. Amen. So I want you to lock that into your heart and allow that, uh, uh, allow that to be true as we talk about this. So John is a type of the bride. Amen. And John is the apostle of love. And, and as we look through this, we're going to see John has a unique relationship with the Lord. John has a unique revelation. John, is, John sees what none of the other disciples see. John John was the youngest disciple at the time Jesus was walking on this earth. And after he departed, amen, John with a special relationship with, with Jesus Christ, amen, and we'll explore that through the scriptures. But, but 
he's the last apostle, amen, to remain alive after they're all deceased, amen, and it's all showing a time because John was the one who made it longest. He was the longest lasting or the longest living disciple, amen, and he made it all the way to the island of Patmos where he was caught up in a vision and taken to the Lord's day, and he saw all the way to the end, amen. And so he's a type of the bride because the bride would be the last of the seven church ages. She would be the last, amen, of the bride, the last of the bride that would be on earth. So she outlived them all. You see that? And she herself will get caught up, amen, into the revelation and see all the way to the end as well. So you see the types and similarities. We're talking about John, the Apostle John. We're talking about the, 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 the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, and the Book of Revelation. But what we're really wanting to see is an identification of ourselves. Amen. So Brother Bram says in the message, do you now believe? So now in St. John you say, uh, Brother Branham, you sure read a lot out of St. John. He said, it's one of my favorites. John is a book of love. Oh my goodness, we're going to see it. You get into the epistles of John. It's so evident in the epistles of John, first, second, and third. Amen. All through it, he's crying out, little children love one another. Above all things, love one another. He that knoweth God, amen. He, that knoweth, uh, uh, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. The things that we just read. But all through these apostles, or these epistles, first, second, third, he's talking about love and love one another and love the brethren. And, 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 and all of these things, he says, if you don't love one another, how can you say you love God? who you've not seen, and you can't love your brother who you can see. Amen. John is the apostle of love. The epistles are all about love. But then Brother Branham says that St. John, the gospel of John, is a book of love. What is the relationship between Christ and his bride? It's a love relationship. All of these, you see what I'm, I'm trying to say? All of these pieces are starting to congeal and paint one picture. Amen. So... And, and this is where Brother Ram says that about the epistles. And he said, we always know, uh, Peter, of course, we always know that he's the great burly faith that just reaches out after it, whether you can see it or not. And hope is James. And John was charity because John, even his epistles were called the epistles of love. So now we see John is love. And, and, and we heard uh, 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 when, when uh, uh, Brother Kyle preached, he talked about Peter, James, and John, faith, hope, and charity, charity's love. And they were taken up on the Mount Transfiguration to be those witnesses. John is always typed with love, and John is typed with the bride. Amen. Amen. So now we're beginning to see our position. Now, in the breach, uh, 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 Brother Branham starts to explain something in the breach that I want to capture as well. But let's first turn to Revelation chapter 4 together and let's read this scripture. By the grace of God, I'm just going to throw a ton of pieces out and then ask God to help us put them together. So don't get nervous. We're throwing puzzle pieces everywhere. But we ask God to help us find where they fit. Revelation chapter 4 verse 6. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face of a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So now when John gets caught up into the throne, of, throne room of God in chapter 4 here, he now sees a door in heaven, a voice has come up hither. He goes up and he sees one sitting on the throne and he starts to describe everything that he sees. But round about the throne, in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne are these cherubims and one was likened to a lion, one likened to a, an ox, one likened to a man, and one likened to an eagle. And Brother Branham picks this up in the breach and he says, now remember the lion and the ox and so forth, the head of the man and so forth, and then watch those seraphims to the word while all Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John all stood around the book of Acts. Now, Brother Bram's talking about the cherubims around the throne, and he ties it to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John around the book of Acts. He makes this parallel. 
And he, and he goes on to say further in the breach, he says, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those gospels are standing there guarding that, the wisdom of a man, the power of the lion, the work of an ox, the swiftness of the leopards, or the eagle, rather. Yes, the gospel standing there. Remember when we had it in the seven church ages. And Brother Ram, he when he preaches the seven church ages, he, he talks about this, and he goes into it in Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5 back in 1960 and 61 when he preaches it. But what he begins to show is that around the throne of God are these four living creatures. And you can pick it up in Ezekiel, and in Ezekiel they have the same cherubims, and these cherubims each had four faces, and they each had, whichever way they looked, they had a face of a lion, face of an ox, face of a man, and face of an eagle. And Brother Ram ties it to the cherubims all the way back on the eastern gate of Eden when God had to move the man out of Eden because he had fallen in sin, and he put cherubims there with a flaming sword turning every which away to keep the way of the tree of life. Amen. And those were cherubims, and Brother Ram ties those cherubims to the ones in Ezekiel to the ones in Revelation chapter 4. So we see there's four, and Brother Bram shows that the, those four living creatures were four anointings that were over the church through the seven church ages. Amen. When the apostles came out preaching, come out in the, uh, Pentecost and the apostle Paul came out to establish the word, they were under a lion anointing. They stood against the face of all opposition with boldness and they boldly proclaimed the word and the word was written down and we got the New Testament. Amen. But then after that, we would have a change in the horse rider from the white horse rider of deception. That lion anointing was fighting that deception with the true word. But then it would come, amen, into a red horse that would begin to fight. And as it would take up the sword and begin the fight, there was an ox anointing that came to the church, amen, and they would become martyrs and they would lay down their life for the word. These are, this, these are four anointings over the church, amen? And so then, amen, as we move into the dark ages and the black horse would begin to ride and he had stomped out everything and brought everything into a, a, a dark age, amen, God would raise up the man anointing, which is intelligence and wisdom, amen, and he would start to print the word and start to translate the word and start to bring the word back through the man anointing. And that man anointing was the anointing over the reformers. It was over uh, the Lutheran age, the Wesleyan age, and the Pentecostal age. Amen. But at the end of the Pentecostal age, there was going to be an eagle anointing that would come. And the eagle anointing is the prophetic anointing because it can fly high and see far off. And these are the anointings over the church age. And Brother Branham shows them around the throne of God because the throne of God is where the life is because God is the life. Amen. Amen. So they were guarding the throne. And he takes us back, I mean, all the way back to the tabernacle in the wilderness. And when God would set up the children of Israel to camp around that, amen, each of those tribes would have a standard. That standard was their flag. On the flag would be a symbol. And they would have four main, uh, four main camps or tribes around. And with them was another two associated with, or another three associated with them. Right? No, another two. There was three to make 12. I think I got it. So around each of them was the standard of Judah, the lion, the ox, the man, and Dan, the eagle. With the camping with the standards around the throne of God, which was in the tabernacle, was the lion, ox, man, and eagle. In heaven, around the throne was the lion, ox, man, and eagle. Amen. Guarding the way to the tree of life. Amen. This all has to do with the tree of life. This all has to do with life. Guarding the, keeping the way to the tree of life was the cherubims with the four faces. The four anointings. What were the four anointings doing? It, it, at first, we used to think through the church ages that those cherubims were there keeping them away from the tree of life. But that's not what the scripture says. They were keeping the way of the tree of life. They were preserving a way back to life. They were making sure the path stayed open. Amen. And those four anointings, amen, now, uh, Brother Bram said, are the four gospels, amen, around the book of Acts. Because what is the book of Acts? He said the book of Acts, amen, is when, amen, was when Christ came to his throne. Where was the throne? In the book of Acts, the throne came into the heart of man. He said, when did it come into the heart of man? At the day of Pentecost. So now the throne of God in Acts, amen, was the day of Pentecost when, when Christ came into the heart of man. And what was keeping the way or guarding the way or leading the way to the throne? It was those four gospels. You pass through the four Gospels, then you come to the book of Acts. 
Amen. Amen. More puzzle pieces. So now, Brother Bam takes those four Gospels and puts an anointing upon each. And showing on the book of Matthew is the lion anointing, the king anointing. And when you read Matthew, you can see it so easily. You open it up and it starts with the lineage of the house of David. Showing here comes the king through the lineage of the house of David. And it starts right in the beginning. There's a lion anointing. You go to the book of Mark and Mark is talking about the lamb of God. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. You come to Luke. Luke was the physician. He was the intellect. He was the Gentile. And when you go to Luke, Luke starts breaking down all the scientific facts between who married who and how the baby came and the angel and what it said. And he puts all the pieces together. Even the way the book, book of Luke starts, it doesn't start like the other ones. Matthew starts with a lineage because it's the book of the king. Amen. It's the lion book. Uh, Mark starts right. Uh, Mark is so simple like an ox. It starts right into the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was a man named John. Yeah. But Luke is Luke writing to somebody, O Theophilus, I have sat down to record these things that we know to hold to be true. So that It's the man anointing. You can see it right from the beginning. But when you get to John, John doesn't talk about John the Baptist. He's not talking about Zacharias. He doesn't do a lineage. John says, in the beginning was the word. He goes all the way back before there was an earth, before there was any creation. And because it's an eagle anointing, it's flying so much higher than everything else. From that perspective, he goes all the way back. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Oh, praise God. I'm so glad we had a prophet. The prophet, he takes everything and he puts, this is why I'm saying when you look at the message and you look at the Bible, amen, I'm telling you, there's a thousand puzzle pieces. There may be 10,000 puzzle pieces. He talks about cherubims and Eden. He talks about the Ezekiel cherubims. He talks about the heaven. He talks about the gospels. He talks about the book of Acts. He talks about a throne in heaven. He talks about a throne in the heart. And it's like, what are all these pieces? Amen. But all by the grace of God, if he can take everything the prophet said and everything's in the scripture and put it together, it makes one picture and it's a beautiful picture. And here we come, the last gospel, the fourth gospel. Matches the fourth beast, which is the eagle. And that book of John is so unlike the other three gospels. It's so unique in so many ways that Brother Bram said, he said, somebody accused him, said, Brother Bram, you sure read out of St. John a lot. I wonder why. We were under the eagle anointing. And so now, when we look at John, John's the apostle of love. His epistles are the epistle of love. Brother Branham said the book of John is a book of love. But he also says it's the eagle anointing. It's the eagle anointing on that book. So when we look at John, who's also a type of the bride, you've got to tie in the love, the book of love, with the eagle anointing and attach those two together. And I hope we can find ourselves there. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 1. And look here. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his, by his angel unto his servant, John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So we start right off with the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the capstone of the whole Bible. And it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And Brother Branham said this whole book is the record of Christ. So this book of Revelation is an unveiling of the entire Bible. Amen. And it's the revelation of Jesus Christ because the whole book was about Christ. And it's the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. What do you mean shortly come to pass? Because this was written 2,000 years ago. But you have to realize it was shortly come to pass from the time it was revealed, which was in our age. 
And he sent and signify it by his angel unto his servant John. I wonder who that angel represents. Which angel came and brings the revelation of Jesus Christ to John, the type of the bride? We know that that's Brother Branham. Amen. So we find ourselves in the scriptures. And then we see that. Then we go into chapter 1 and, and we, we see a description of, of Christ in the midst of the seven churches, which are the seven church ages. So it's Christ through the seven church ages in the midst of his church. Amen. And then we go to, to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 is a description of the seven church ages coming down through time. But at the end of the seven church ages, we go to Revelation chapter 4. It's amazing. It's another four again. Just like the fourth beast and just like the fourth gospel. The fourth gospel is John. The fourth beast is an eagle. And the fourth chapter is a catching up for a greater revelation. Not the earthly things now, now the heavenly things. And he says in John chapter 4, verse 1, after this, Brother Bram says, after what? After these church ages. Amen. And brother, later, Brother Bram is going to tell us, and before the tribulation. So this is going to take place at the end of the church ages and before the tribulation. Happens to be exactly where we're standing right now. He said, after this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was it as it were of the trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And I immediately was in the spirit and behold, a throne was in heaven and one sat on the throne. Amen. So now Brother Bram says in Revelation chapter one from 1960, or I'm sorry, Revelation chapter four said, oh, notice John being taken up immediately after the church age was a type of the raptured church. Immediately after the church age is over, this Laodicea church age, then comes the rapture. The church goes up like John did into the presence of God. And then he comes to Revelation chapter 4, uh, part 2, which he preaches uh, on January 1st, 1961. The other one was January or, uh, December 31st. So one was New Year's Eve and one was New Year's Day. 1961, he says, there was a living creature, what John represented what John represented the entire church was taken up. I told you one person here in a vision can represent the entire body of Christ. Again, he says in Revelation chapter four, this is part one. He says, now notice he's finished his work in earth and he, on earth and he took his church and now he sends the judgment. The world rejected him and he sends the judgment. He and his church has gone to glory. John there on the Isle of Patmos, a revelator to the church, has been the type of the church which is lifted up into glory. Come up hither. So you see, he represented the church. To everyone that hears this word, John represents him. That's me. I'm going to take that as me. To everyone that hears this word, John represents him. Amen. John was the represent, representative of the blood of Jesus Christ, testimony of the word. He was a witness of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and a personal fellowship with Christ. And he represented the entire church that every man or woman, boy or girl that ever believed in Christ, accept him on the same grounds. He'll be summoned someday, come up hither. He got up before the tribulation. Remember, the tribulation time hasn't set in yet. This is being the time setting of the judgment. John is being showed now what's going to take place after the church age, see? To everyone that hears this word, John represents him. And who is John? The apostle of love. Who is John? Amen. John is the one who writes the gospel under the eagle anointing. John is the one who gets caught up in the heavenly places and sees. Amen. John is the one who starts the, 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 his gospel off within the beginning was the word. Amen. And John is the one who gets caught up in the vision on the Isle of Patmos and sees all the way to the end of time. He sees from the beginning of time to the end of time. Amen. And everyone that believes this word, John represents him. Amen, because what has God done to the bride in this end time? He's lifted her up to see, amen, all the way back to the mystery in the back part of God's mind from the beginning of time, all the way to what's going to unfold in the end time and what's coming after. Praise God. Praise be to God. Amen. And now, in the invisible union of the bride... I, I, I don't know how else to do this, but just keep throwing out puzzle pieces, amen? I hope God's starting to lay them in the right place for you. 
He says, you're the virtuous bride of Christ, washed in the blood of Christ, precious, virtuous, sinless son of God, standing with a pure, unadulterated bride word that he washed by the water of his own blood. That became flesh and manifested that he might take you, which were predestinated in the bosom of the Father, before the beginning, the same as he was. So where did you come from? Wherever he came from is where you came from. You were predestinated in the bosom of the Father before the beginning, the same as he was. Oh, praise God. Which, which other age knew this? Which other generation understood these things and had this pronounced over them by a prophet? And then he goes on to say, he was that great attribute of God called love. So what is Christ? Christ is love. What is God? God is love. Is that right? That what uh, Paul tells us, or John tells us in the epistle, God is love. Amen. God is love. But he also tells us that God is the word. So God is the word and God is love. And Christ is the word. And Christ is the attribute of God called love. And then Christ's bride came from the bosom of the Father, the same place by predestination that Christ came from. And John is a type of her, and he's the apostle of love. So what do you think we are? We're part of that great love and that great love relationship and that great expression of the attribute of God's love. That's what this whole drama is unfolding, to show God's love. Amen. So now let's go to John 13 together. Oh, there's so many things that I want to get into, and I don't know how. God, help us, please. Now we're looking. I want you to recognize we're reading out of St. John. So, so when we read this, I want us to understand John's a type of the bride. John's the apostle of love. John has a special relationship with Christ, and this book is under an eagle anointing. Now look, John 13, 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, this is the last supper. This is after he's washed the disciples' feet. He testified and said, verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. You want to guess who that was? We all know because Brother Bram tells us and the Gospels tell us that this is John. John, the youngest of the apostles. John that will outlive all the apostles. John who will get caught up in the revelation and see the end time. John who will understand the mystery of those seven thunders. You see how John's a type of the bride? You see how you, amen, can find your identification in John? And here is that same John who will receive the revelation of the seven thunders. See from the beginning, and the beginning was the word, all the way to the end. This same John, where is he in the Last Supper? He's laying on the bosom of Jesus. What a relationship that this John has to Christ. It's unlike any of the other disciples. And he has a title that none of the other disciples have. And that title is, He Whom Jesus Loved. And we'll find it all through the book of John. That's the title that is given to John. It says, now, let's read it again. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it would be of whom he spake. Now, Peter is not going to say, uh, Jesus, who is it? No, he goes to the one with the special relationship, one that's closest. Peter, amen, Peter, is, Brother Bram said Peter is faith, John is love. Amen, he said Peter was burly with faith and he was bold and he was out there. Amen, but as burly and bold as he was out there with his faith, he knew that it took something else to get this divine revelation, this hidden secret. Amen, and, and so he would, he would motion to love because Brother Bram said faith worketh by love. So here is faith. And and he's calling to the one whom the Lord loveth. And he says, would you whom the Lord loveth with love, would you with love ask him who it is? Yeah. Amen. Amen. When we climb this ladder of the statue of a perfect man, what is the goal? What are we trying to get to? What is the capstone? It's charity. It's love. And, and, and love, uh, I'd say it like this, love is not a virtue. Love is a person, the attribute of love, the person of God, the person of Christ. Amen whom the bride came out of his bosom. It's, it's not, if I, could, if I could say it without getting it wrong, it's not like acquiring love, it's almost like reconnecting with love. 
It's almost like love coming back together. Amen. So now Jesus, he laid in Jesus' bosom one of the disciples. Simon Peter therefore beckoned unto him. Hey. Asking that he should ask who it, who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest do quickly. What did, what did John receive? He received a private revelation from Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That the other disciples didn't. Because it said the, when he got up and left, the other disciples, the disciples around the table all wondered why he left. And some thought it was to take care of some business. And they didn't even know why he left. Amen. But Jesus said, one's going to betray me. And they all began to be concerned who it would be. And Peter says, Peter knew John could get it from Jesus. How did Peter know that? And John, who is on the breast of Jesus, he's embraced with Jesus. He's connected to Jesus. He's over the heart of Jesus. And he says, who is it? And Jesus says, whomever I dip the sop and hand it to. And then he just dipped the sop and handed it to Judas. Amen. You know what? There's going to be an antichrist. And Judas was the Antichrist, amen, but the Antichrist was right in their midst, amen, and nobody knew, right in the church, amen, right in the church was the Antichrist, and nobody knew who the Antichrist was, but John received a revelation of how to identify the Antichrist, and this bride in this day has received the revelation of how to identify the Antichrist, and everybody was confused about Judas, but this, this John was not confused about Judas because he had received the key to understanding who the Antichrist Christ was. Not the name, it's this one and this one, but the key to understand. And this bride has been given the key to understand. Amen. Judas would eventually reveal himself. Is that true? And after he betrayed the, the Lord with a kiss, they all then knew who the Antichrist was, but there was one who got a key before he declared himself. And we know that this Antichrist is going to incarnate in a pope and he's going to, he, he is going to declare himself. But before he declared himself, there's already one on the bosom of Jesus who's already been told who that Antichrist is. Amen. Why? Because of love. What Peter couldn't get, John could. Why? Because of love. Praise be to God. Brother Bram says, in Christ is the mystery of God revealed. But God's great mystery, what the eternal God has had as a mystery, has now been unfolded in Jesus Christ and given right down to his church. What was once God's, God's mind is now in the body of Christ. Jesus making love to the church, his bride, whispering secrets to her. Where is she? She's in the relationship like John was. You know how you tell your wife things? You know the little girl you're going to marry? You love her so much, you just tell her the secrets and get her up next to you and love you and everything? You know how it is. That's what God Christ is doing to the church. He's letting her know the secrets, just the secrets, not these flirters, I mean his wife. All right, now look, by having the revelation of his secret made known to them by his grace, how the grace of God... How is God now taking this little bride, this little wife, and he's taking her up next to him, up close to himself. He's embracing her and he's whispering the love secrets to her. Not the flirters, they don't get anything, amen, but this one that's, the, that, that's the, the recipient of his love. And he says, how is it coming? How is this all coming? By his grace. And Brother Bram tells us in the, in the message title, the message of grace, he said, think of it, love and grace is sisters, Twin sisters. You can't have grace without having love. So what is it that this great grace and favor that God now wants to whisper the love, what, where does it come from? It's his love expressed. It's his love. His grace is his love. So why is he whispering the secrets? Because of love. You can't have grace without having love. They're twin sisters. 
That's exactly right. Before you can have grace, you have to have love. Before you can actually show somebody a favor, you, you love them. Right or wrong, you have to love them anyhow or you can't see. So love and grace is the same thing. They're just twin sisters, love and grace. So if you, if you believe you're the recipient of his grace, you are the object of his love. Because love and grace is twin sisters. You can't have grace without first having love. So how is it he's whispering these love secrets? By his grace, because of his love. Why? Because John was the one whom the Lord loved, and he got the secret. Again, in Christ is the mystery God revealed. He said, but his mystery is only revealed to his beloved bride. That's the only one could see it. This mystery is only revealed to one, and that's his beloved bride. She is what? The object of his love. She's the recipient of his grace. That's why, for me, we can say, you know, once, we, once we're able to realize that God has given me a revelation of this message, all of a sudden, every fear and anxiety and every worry should vanish out of the window because nobody else receives this. This is a special relationship. This is grace that's based on love, and it only comes to the whom the Lord beloved. It's only the whom the Lord loved. Only those who are drawn up close to the Lord and lying on his breast are the only ones that get these secrets. And if all of a sudden he's going to reveal these secrets to you and your heart is going to open and you're going to say, I don't know that I can intellectually understand it, but something in my heart is exploding right now that I know that what that prophet is teaching is nothing but the truth. Amen. And all of a sudden you realize, you should realize you're a recipient of that grace that only the bride gets these love seekers. This revelation is only given to one girl. It's not given to the flirters. It's not given to the rest of the town. It's only given to one and it's the one that he's drawing up close and whispering the secret. That's the one he loves. Praise God. I want to I look at this in the book of John, so if you could just bear with me. I want to go through a little quick Bible study if I can. Amen. And let's look at Matthew. Let's turn to Matthew. We're going go, to go Matthew, Mark, John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We're going to pass through those, and I want to look, because I want to sh- I want to show you the same story told it in three different places. And I want you to see how the revelation is different to John. So Matthew 26, let's start there. Matthew 26, verse six. So Matthew 26 and six. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box, very precious ointment, and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. So this is the principle, this is the story where this woman anoints Jesus with this fragrance, and and they think it's a waste. So let's pick the story up now in Mark, Mark 14. It's going to be the same exact story. Mark 14 and verse 3. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she brake the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why has this waste of this ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. Got it? Same story. Let's go to John 12. John chapter 12, and let's look at verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And there, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. 
Same story told three times. What's the difference? The difference is John has a special revelation where everybody else knows somebody said something, but who is it that said it? When he come under the eagle anointing, amen, the one he loves, he said it was Judas Iscariot. And there's no more mystery of who this mysterious group is or who this mysterious person is. And when we get into the seals, now there's no more mystery of who the souls under the altar are. We know that they're Jews. Who are these 144,000 in Revelation 7? Who are these white-robed ones? Who are these two witnesses? Amen. John, under the eagle anointing, the one who the Lord loves, he gets the special revelation. And when nobody else gets the name, he gets the names. Who's in Revelation 11? Everybody argues, but the bride knows it's Moses and Elijah. Amen. Who's this that's under the altar crying out, how long, O Lord, and the white robes were given? They're the Jews. Amen. Amen. From the time of Christ all the way through, they're the Jews. Amen. In every other age, under every other anointing, it's a mystery. Yeah, there was somebody who said this. Yeah, there's somebody under the altar. Yeah, somebody's crying out. Yeah, there's two witnesses. Yeah, they're there. We know they're there. But who were they? It's John who knows who they were because it's the bride who knows who it is. Praise be to God. Why? Oh, my goodness. Brother Ben says in the fourth seal, so when the lamb had opened the fourth seal, Let's stop there and there on the fourth seal. Now, who opened it? The lamb. Was anybody else worthy? No one else could do it. The lamb opened the fourth seal. And the fourth beast, the living creature like an eagle, said to John, come see what the fourth mystery of the plan of redemption has been hid in the book because the lamb has opened it. In other words, what he was saying, here's the fourth mystery here. And if we go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 7, I'll just read it to you. It says, and when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast. What's that? Eagle. Come and say, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed after him. Amen. What's so significant about this? Because under the other anointings, there was other horse riders. Amen. But it never tells you who the horse rider is. A white, a rider went on a white horse. One went on a red horse. One went on a black. But under the eagle anointing, he gets a name and his name is death and hell follows after him. Why? Because it's under the eagle anointing now. What was laying there as a mystery is now unveiled. They knew there was a horse rider, but it looked like, could it be three different riders? Amen. A, a rider on a white, then a rider. No, but under the eagle anointing, the prophet comes and says, it's been the same rider all along, and it's the Antichrist, and he's moved from white horse to red horse. He got off the red horse, got on the black horse, and he got off the black horse on the pale horse. But under the ministry of the fourth beast, under the anointing, the, uh, the Holy Ghost anointing over the church through a prophetic ministry, which is eagle anointing, he now tells you who this has been all through the church ages. What Matthew couldn't tell you, what Mark couldn't tell you, what Luke couldn't tell you, now under the eagle anointing, under the ministry of John the bride, now you can know it's Judas Iscariot. He's the Antichrist. He's the horse rider. He's also the one that will betray Jesus, betray Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope we're not just seeing John. I hope we're seeing ourselves. Let's go back to Matthew 26. Let's do this one more time, because it's fun. You know, when Brother Bam says, when he opened those seals, he opened the entire Bible. It's going to take us the rest of our time on this planet to keep unlocking what was opened under the opening of those seals. And I don't think we're going to come to the end of it. I think we're going to still be discovering as we move on. Matthew 26, verse 50. This is Jesus when they come to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 50 says, And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Somebody cut off somebody's ear. Now we know it was somebody that was with Jesus and somebody that was a high priest servant. That's all we know. Let's go to Mark 14. So we went from lion, now we're under the ox anointing. We're moving through the church ages. Mark 14, verse 46. 
Mark 14 and 46. And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. That's ox anointing. Let's go to Luke. Luke 22. Luke 22, verse 48. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. It seems like through the church ages, we keep getting the same information on the seals. We know there's characters. We know there's actors. We know something about them. We know some information, one that was with Jesus and one that was among them and one that came and one was a servant of the high priest. And we know that there was a sword and we know he's got his ear cut. We know, we know the symbols. We know all this information, but we don't know who it was. But let's go to John now, John chapter 20. I'm sorry, John chapter 18. John chapter 18 and verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. <laughs> Amen. Not through the church ages, but under the eagle anointing. Amen. Under John, John got the revelation. John declared the revelation, the, the book that's the book of love. Amen. Brother Bram said, this is, the St. John, this is the gospel of love. And he's, he wrote the epistles of love, and he's the apostle of love, the disciple of love, the recipient of love, the one whom God loved, and this book is under an eagle anointing. Brothers and sisters, this is where we're at. This is who we are. This is identifying what age we're in and who we are. Now we know it's Moses and Elijah that'll take the gospel to. And, and it'll, it'll be after the church is caught away. And we know who the church is. Amen. They're the ones that receive this love secret. Nobody else. But only the bride will receive this love secret of the revelation of the seven seals and the mystery of God being finished. She's the one who's going to take the rapture. Now all the rest of them who rejected or never had a chance to hear, they're going to remain. Who's going to go in the rapture? Who's going to go in the tribulation? We know. We can name them. Mrs. Jesus Christ is going up. Bride's going up. Church is staying. We now can name it. We can separate it. We know who the false vine is. We know who the true vine is. We know who the souls under the altar are. We know who the 144,000 are. We know who the white robed ones in Revelation. I mean, my goodness, it's so clear to me now. No wonder Brother Brenham was always reading out of St. John. Oh, praise God. Let's go to John chapter 20 now. Now, can you identify with John? Let's, let's look. John chapter 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and seeth a stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Who's that? That's John, the type of the bride. And saith unto them, they, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, the, the mysterious one, because the bride's been the mystery all the way through the book. Amen. And that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooped down and looked in and saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. 
Before they even realize or remember the scriptures they rise from the dead, as soon as John, who's a type of the bride, who's the apostle of love, who's a special relationship with Jesus, who's under an eagle anointing, as soon as he steps in and he sees the napkin, he sees the clothes, Peter saw it. It doesn't tell us what Peter thought, but Peter went away. But we know he doubted because he was unbraided by the Lord for his unbelief. But when Peter looked in, it said, he believed. He believed. Why? There was something special in him that could believe just upon seeing the empty sepulcher. He didn't need, he didn't need like Thomas to touch the, 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 the prince in his hand and thrust his hand into his side. When he saw that sepulcher, he believed. Amen. Why? I'll tell you why. Because faith worketh by love. He was the recipient of love. He was the special object of love, which gave him a special grace. And he believed. Because faith worketh by love. We love him because he first loved us. It's reciprocating. His grace is bestowed upon us because he loved us. We have the capacity to receive the truth by grace. And grace is love. We're in that special relationship with Christ. Let's go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 3. Simon Peter saith unto them, I'm sorry, John 21. What did I say? To me, John and Revelation about the same thing anyhow, anymore. It's all coming together as one. Let's go, sorry, John 21. I've turned the page once and I heard a lot of turning. I said, something is bad wrong. These folks have big Bibles with big print. John 21, verse 3. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go fishing. They say unto them, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, children, have you any meat? They answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast thy net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of the fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved. You see the pattern? That disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. He was the first one that could recognize the Lord. Why? He was, in the, he was in a covenant of grace. He was in the relationship of love. He had laid in the bosom of Jesus. Amen. There's something special about John, and there's something special about the book of John. I just personally believe that the gospel of John is the bride's gospel. Amen. Amen. So uh, let me keep on reading because this is really interesting. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it was the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him for he was naked and he did cast himself into the sea. You, you, You see... Peter has that burly, bold faith that'll just launch out and just take it, amen? But he needs something to help that faith. And what does he need? Love, because faith worketh by love. This is why, this is why Peter and John were going to the gate beautiful, amen, one day. And, and, and you know what? John never speaks. When, when you see all these encounters with Peter and John and Peter and John and Peter and John, John's hardly ever speaking. When they go to the sepulcher, he stands, he looks in, stands back, lets Peter go first. But after Peter, he goes down and he sees and he believes. Now, when Christ comes on the scene here and, and at, the, at the lake, amen, now he says, it is the Lord. And when love identifies the Lord, faith goes into action and jumps overboard and swims the land. Faith and love, faith worketh by love. John, Peter didn't heal the blind man without love. love. Love may not have been the spokesman that day, but love was there with faith. Praise God. Let's, go, let's look at verse 20 here in the same chapter, chapter 21, verse 20. And before we read that, I want to to take you through a a little um, 
uh, a little discussion that Jesus has with Peter now. Peter swims to shore. I mean, Peter absolutely loves the Lord, but he, he swims to shore. He's a type of faith. He comes to the, to the land, and now Jesus starts looking at Peter, and he asks Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? What was it Peter needed? What was it Peter was missing? What was the missing ingredient in Peter? Peter was bold. Peter had faith. Peter could take the bull by the horn. But what Peter needed was love. After he had had faith, after he could receive a revelation, amen, of who the, from the Father, of who Christ was in Matthew 16, what did he need? He needed love. And he says, now he begins to question him, Peter, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, does thou love me more than these? And he was grieved. He said, you know I love you. He said, feed my lambs. He's now beginning to tie Peter down by love. And love will have Peter living for others. Because living for others is looking heaven in the face. Serving Christ and his sheep, serving his people, is the expression of love. And what Peter needed was to come in contact with love and be tempered by love and be moved by love because faith worketh by love. Peter had dogmatism. He, he knew that this was... I mean, even after they all left and Jesus says, will you go also? He says, uh, where to whom shall we go? Thou alone have the word of life. And we believe and we know that, that, that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He had faith, amen. But that faith was cutting people's ears off, trying to kill them, fighting over who was the greatest in the kingdom, amen. Disputing with Jesus Christ himself whether or not he'll suffer, amen. Faith was, was, was doing a lot. But it needed to be tempered by love because faith worketh by love. Don't you love the word of God? Don't you love the scriptures? How uh, For years, these have been separate pieces, but it's all coming together and painting one picture. Verse 20 now. After Peter goes through this questioning, Jesus tells him, when you're older, you'll go where you don't want. You'll led by those who lead you where you don't want. And he starts to talk about his crucifixion, how he'll die. And then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper. We know who that is. And said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? That's the one that we're talking about now. Peter, seeing him, saith, Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? And Jesus saying to him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Why? Because John's a type of the bride. He's going to be there till the coming of the Lord. That's so beautiful. This scripture has a dual purpose, a dual meaning, and we'll discuss that in a meaning. But he says, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Who testified of these things? Well, look at the top of the page. John. This is the gospel of John, the epistle of John. This is the one who wrote yeah. these things and, te- and we know that his testimony is the truth. Why? Because he's loved. He's under the ego anointing and he knows the truth Amen. and can testify of the truth. <clears throat> In Revelation chapter four, Brother Bram said, Peter said, what are, what, are you, what are you going to do with him? That fellow that's going to happen to him. He said, what is it to you if, if he sees me coming? And he let him live to see it. After the rest of them was dead and gone, John lived to see the coming of the Lord. Rehearsed in power, the whole scene set from his time until the judgment is over and the millennium is issued in. John saw every bit of it and the millennium over and the kingdom age started. So he keeps his word, doesn't he? Amen. 
He says, what if I, amen, and they misunderstood it and they made it a natural thing and it was going to be a spiritual thing. And John was there, amen, on the Isle of Patmos and he was caught up in the vision. He was there, amen, between the church ages and the tribulation and their door was open in heaven and he heard a voice say, come up hither and he got, he come up higher and he saw the lamb take the book. He saw the seals come off the book. He, he heard the seven thunders. He saw, amen, the tribulation period. He saw the battle of Armageddon. He saw the millennium set in and he saw all the new heavens and new earth to sin. Why? Because he's a type of the bride. Why? I'll tell you why. Oh my goodness. I got two more scriptures, a couple more scriptures I want to get to. Oh, I want to get to this one. Let's go to this one right now. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. Sometimes I just don't know how to express it all. 1 Corinthians 13. This is why he says this. And to me, this is just the way I catch things. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can move mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Everything else will fade away, but charity is going all the way to the end. And here is Peter, talking faith, talking about love. Where, what if he endures it? Why? Because faith is going to make it, or love is going to make it all the way to the end. And faith, which worketh by love, will go all the way to the end too. But it's going to take love. Without love, it's nothing. But with love, it will endure. Praise be to God. Now let's turn together to Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 8. This is after John hears the seven thunders. John has got the revelation of the seven thunders, which are the mysteries revealed in the seven seals. And he's already heard it. John knows it. He heard it. He was going to write it, but he was told to seal it up. But John has already received the revelation of the seven seals, which are the seven thunders. And after he got that revelation, he hears a voice, verse 8, and the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and I said unto him, give me the little book. And he said unto me, take it and eat it up and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand. Now listen, this is the same book, Brother Bram says, in Revelations 5 was sealed with seven seals. And no man could touch it, nor look upon it, nor read it. Amen. Same book. And Brother Bram says, the book of life is the title deed of all redemption. It's the marriage certificate. It's the Bible. Yeah. Amen. It's the revelation of the mystery of God. That book in Revelation 5 is sealed. In Revelation 10, the mighty angel comes down with an open book in his hand. And now John is told to go to that angel, which Brother Branham says is Christ, to go to that angel and take that open book that's been unsealed and not just take it, but to become one with it, to eat it, to bring it inside of you. Brother Branham said, don't just come this far and say, I believe the message. You take the message. You take it into you. Amen. You feed on it and you become one with it and you identify with it and it'll be sweet as honey in your mouth. Why? Because when you receive the revelation of the word, it's absolutely thrilling. But when you go to live it, it's the same life Jesus Christ led. It's rejection and scorn and ridicule and misunderstanding. But then he says, verse 10, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it up and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations, tongues and kings. Prophesy again. What anointing is John under? The eagle anointing, 
which is the prophetic anointing. Here's what Brother Brenham says back in the message as the eagle stirs her nest. He said, no, sir, Papa Eagle, they look just like him. They believe the same thing he does. They look like him. Yes, sir, they're made like him. They're built like him. And he knows they're genuine eagles. Oh, my, that's what God wants, genuine messiah. He is Messiah. Messiah is the anointed one. And we are his children, which, ha- which have a lesser anointing. As Jehovah Eagle is great eagle and we're eaglets. He's Messiah and we with the same anointing are messiahs. Amen. Anointed. Messiah means the anointed one. Are you anointed? Amen. What with? The same spirit that he is anointed with. We have it in measure. He has it without measure. He was God manifest in flesh. We are sons of God, parts of him coming on. What is it? Take the book. Take the open book. Take the revealed word. Take it into yourself. Feed on it. Eat it. Eat it all up. Amen. Take all of the message in and become one with it. Digest it. Let it become you. That's what happens to our food. Our food becomes us. Amen. Eat it until the message becomes us, until the message starts to manifest in flesh. Our food, when you go and eat food, that food is going to come into a fleshly manifestation. Is that right? It's going to make cells. It's going to make hair, make blood cells. It's going, to, it's going to move your body, make muscle. Why? The food is coming the manifestation. This message has to come to a fleshly manifestation. But in order for that to happen, you've got to take the book from Christ and you've got to eat it up. Why? And then prophesy again. Why do you mean prophesy again? This doesn't mean that we're all going to have prophetic ministry. That means we're under a prophetic ministry. We're under an eagle anointing. And we're going to prophesy again. means to prophesy what's already been prophesied. We're just going to say what the prophet says. Amen? Because the prophet and the bride and the spirit will be saying the same thing. Do you see your identif- identification with John? John's a type of the bride and a special relationship with the Lord. Now, I want to look at just a couple things, and we're finishing with this. That Brother Branham said, just one, this, this one time he says this. He says it many times, but I just pulled one quote. He said, John, after he returned from the Isle of Patmos out in the Aegean Sea, only thing he could say was, little children love one another. He found there was something real. What did this experience on the Patmos Island do for him? What happened on Patmos? He got the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ was unveiled to him. The opening of the seals, the end time mysteries, the events, the mystery of God. He got all of it. And when he came back from that experience, what was his main message? Love. Little children love one another. Why? Because God is love. And they that know God know him. Our love. He had come into something real. Love brings revelation. What brought revelation to John? Special revelation none of the other disciples got. Special revelation in the book of John that none of the other gospels, what was that? It was love because he was the one whom the Lord loved. So love brings revelation because we receive these secrets by grace. But revelation brings love. Because when John came back, he wrote the epistles of love. The most important message that he had was the capstone, charity. Without love, it's nothing. Faith to move mountains. All knowledge to understand all mysteries. This is what Paul declares. But if I have not love, it is nothing. John had received the same revelation. He had seen... He had seen the church ages. He had seen the coming of the Lord. He had seen the battle of Armageddon. He had seen the millennium. He had seen it all. And when he comes back, the main message that he preaches... Is just love each other. When it's all said and done, everything has come out of that great resource of love and everything goes back to that great well of love. And it's all about love. Love brings revelation and revelation brings love. That's why I can't sing revelation bringing contention. 
dispute, disagreement, and hostility. It didn't do it with John. Amen. That's the way Peter was when he had faith without love. But faith worketh by love. It wasn't that Peter didn't have faith, but he had to be brought into something else and he had to be united with John. And him and John, after the, after the, uh, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the day of Pentecost, Peter and John had to work together. Brother Brenham says in the message, Desperations, he says, now the word plainly states, if you want to put this down in Galatians 5, 6, that faith worketh by love. Faith worketh by love, and the only way that you can have faith is have love first. Because after all, faith is love's incentive. Incentive, that's exactly what faith is. It's an incentive to love. Now, if you don't have love, you can't have faith. What was, what was God's incentive to do all of this for us? Love. What is our incentive to believe God and give ourselves love? It's a reciprocating love. Amen. What brings the revelation to our hearts? God's love. Amen. Pure and simple. It's God's grace, which grace is a twin sister to love. Why do you see what you see? Because of love. Because of his love for you. Why is the book open to you? Why does the message seem to resonate in your heart? Why don't you stumble over it? Why can you accept it when thousands can't accept that God sent a prophet? Thousands can't believe, millions can't believe that the seals are open. They can't recognize the coming of the Lord. Why for you it's not a problem? Why? Because that's his love to you. That's grace. And if you're a recipient of that grace and that love, amen, then the reflection of that, of getting caught up like John was caught up, to go through the open door, to see the opening of the seals, to understand the thunders, and see the sequence of events all the way to the end time. And I believe that's what we've been given in this day, amen, by the opening of the seals and the message after. Everything has been declared to the bride. She has seen from before the beginning to after the end. And what does that vision produce? It produces the apostle of love who writes the epistles of love. And when he gets to the point he can't preach anymore, he has one message, amen. He'll sit in the corner of the church and when he's asked to testify, he'll say the same thing every time. Little children love one another. Because everything else will come to naught. And prophecies will cease. Everything else will eventually be finished. But love, charity will never fade away. I am so glad that I can say by his grace that I'm a recipient of his love. I can see myself in the book of John. I can see myself in the apostle of love. Not because of my great love for him, but because of his great love for me. What is it doing me? My goodness, when it all comes down to the end, I'm, I mean the end, end, end. I'm not going to care that I won an argument. In fact, when it comes down to the end, end, then, I might be pretty embarrassed I won that argument because of the way I won it. It comes all down to the end. I want to be like John. I just want to love everybody. God will sort it all out. I don't have to sort it all out. It's not up to me. I just want to declare this great truth. He's told me who the Antichrist is. I know. John could write it. John could speak it. John, no. And John wasn't afraid to say who cut the ear off and whose ear got cut off and who the 144,000 is and who's under the altar and who the two witnesses are and who the bride is and who the foolish virgin is and who the false. Amen. He just had the truth. But he wasn't arrogant and hostile. He just says, just love everybody and just love each other. God will sort it all out. I'm only here to prophesy again. I'm not here to win arguments, and I'm certainly not here to convince people. That doesn't work. I'm just here to prophesy again. And whoever is a recipient of his love will connect to the word, and they will reciprocate his love. And I'm so thankful for the love of God. Let's all stand. Musicians, if you'll please come. I hope that God helped put those pieces together. Because it all, to me, the more I study the scriptures and the more the message opens to me, everything links together. Because you know what the word is? It's God. 
It's God. Do you know what love is? It's God. Amen. You know what Christ is? He's God. You know what the bride is? She's part of the same thing. When it all comes down to it, it all comes back to one thing, and it's just God. It's life. It's love. It's the great fountain of everything. In the end, it all comes back to the same thing expressed in a family. Man, there's nothing else to strive for but that. We're going back to the original. And that's all I want. That's the desire of my heart. But I can see myself so clearly in the scriptures like never before. I can see what time, what age, what gospel, what anointing, what love that we're aligned with. Praise be to God. I tell you, if you're here and maybe sometimes things are a struggle for you, you don't feel like you have the revelation of the word. Listen, let me tell you, it's not just a bunch of intellectualism. Brother Bear says it is an understanding. You have an understanding. But that doesn't mean you have to understand all the 10,000 puzzle pieces in detail. But what you need is God to show you the picture. The picture on the box. Amen. That makes all the pieces make more sense. And listen, I'll tell you the secret. This is, I'll, I'll just put you in a, a little secret. Just lean on his bosom and say, would you show me the picture? Don't fret, don't fuss, don't, don't try to go out and get a bunch of uh, understanding. Don't, don't strain, don't make your brain cramp. Don't do it. Just lay on his bosom in that special love relationship with him. Get really close to him and say, I can just imagine, John, if you're laying on somebody's bosom, your head is down here. So when Peter beckons to him and say, ask, John would just, you know, when you look up at somebody, it's kind of pitiful. It's not arrogant. It's not demeaning. It's kind of, and won't you just get up close to the Lord and just give him that look? And say, Lord Jesus, would you show me the revelation of this? Would you reveal yourself to me? Listen, it's his great desire to do it. When John asked him, he said, immediately. There wasn't, we don't have any notion in the Bible that he thought about it. It took him 30 minutes. And he just said, whomsoever I dipped a slop in hand. And then he dipped a slop in I mean, it wasn't complicated. Let's not make it complicated. Let's just lean on his bosom and say, if there's anything in the message that's stumbling you, there's anything that you feel like you need to know better, just lean on his bosom and say, who is it? Would you show it to me? And he will. He'll give you the key of revelation because it works by love. Brother Bram says, faith is a revelation and faith worketh by love. So revelation worketh by love. It comes by love. It worketh by love. It's demonstrated by love. Thank God. Man, let's just bow our heads and thank the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for you are so good to us, Lord. God, when we look at John, I don't see John at the Last Supper reclining with his head on your bosom as one that you love. God, somehow I'm able to see myself there. God, there's no way I could do that in my own flesh, with my own ability, with my upbringing. And God, it's only by grace that you allow me to feel that I can be in that place. God, I, I want to take advantage of the love that you've shown to me and the great grace that you've given in my life, Lord. And I just want to recline on your bosom, over your heart. And I just want to say, Lord, would you reveal more to me? Would you open more understanding? Would you show me more of your great drama, your great picture, so that I can see? Because God, it was your pleasure, it was your joy to give special revelation to John. I believe it's your joy to whisper the love secrets to your bride. And God, we're leaning against you now, asking God, would you whisper the love secrets into our ears? so that we would know you better? And would you bring a greater love, a greater manifestation of love out of our lives? Give us the ability to love everyone, sinner or saint, whether they love us back or not. But Lord, let us just be so grateful for the love you bestowed upon us. Help us just operate out of a position of charity, of love. 
We love you, Father. We ask that you would manifest yourself in us. Help us, Lord, to take that book and eat it up. Not to leave some out, but to eat it up. Become one with it and give us the strength by love to have the faith to prophesy again. Give us the courage and the wisdom to share this message, these truths. Just like your apostle John did, he shared the truth. What, what Matthew, Mark, and Luke couldn't, he said. What the previous ages couldn't say because it was veiled in a ministry, a mystery, this bride can say it. Help us, Lord, to prophesy again. We love you, Father. We ask that you would help us, and we thank you for your great love and grace that you bestowed upon us. Help us to live and operate by that love. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all, Brother Ben. I want to live just the way he wants me to live. I want to give until there's just no Oh